I'm very excited to be here. One of my most exciting parts about being here is they're actually teaching this stuff, right? In 1978, when I got involved, no one had a clue about environmental chemicals, human health, residential areas, how those impact one another. Uh, and, and our health department was like, you know, we have workplace standards. You don't live in a workplace, you work in a community, you live in a community. We don't know what to do with you. We don't know what numbers are safe. We don't know anything. And so I have to tell you, I am just extraordinarily excited over the fact that they are now teaching this in school. And we, when you go to do your public health whatever after you graduate, that you actually will have a sense of what communities are faced with and how you might approach that problem. So thank you all for deciding this as a career. And I look forward to seeing you on the front lines. And I look forward to seeing you on my side of the front lines, <laughs> not the other side. So I, I want to tell you a little bit about the story of Love Canal. I know many of you know about it. Um, and, and I really want to bring it into today's world. Even though it was 40 years ago, actually it was more than 40 years ago, um, the same thing is happening today as happened 40 years ago. You don't have to go very far to, to see it. You can see it at the 35th Avenue Superfund site. Four neighborhoods. Four neighborhoods where residents can't breathe. Where their homes have been devalued. Nobody wants to buy their homes, right? Because there's all these chemicals in the air, in the soil. Same as Love Canal, different source, different chemicals, maybe. The banks won't give them loans for their home because their homes are worth nothing. So when they get a hole in the roof, they can't fix the roof. And when the water comes in from the rain and creates mold and other problems that we all understand, then somehow it's their fault for letting their house deteriorate. It's not the fault of the surroundings. You don't have to go far to find a love canal in your own backyard. And the stories play out exactly the same. The people that live in the 35th Avenue Superfund site are really not a whole lot different than me what I was back 40 years ago. So 40 years ago, I got married to my high school sweetheart. <laughs> and we had a baby. And I said, it's time to buy a house. Michael was one years old. And so we found this house in the LaSalle district of Niagara Falls. It was not called Love Canal. It was actually in the city limits. And so we moved into this house, and it was lovely. It was a three-bedroom ranch. It had a full basement. We had a pool table down there. It was really cool. Um, and you know, we had HBO, which was the only thing we had back then. We didn't have tweets. We didn't have you know, emails, all that kind of thing. HBO was the, was the thing. And we were living our lives, our American dreams, the same way the people in the 35th Avenue site thought they were doing, right? Then suddenly my kids got sick. Michael, who was perfectly healthy when we moved in, perfectly healthy, suddenly developed asthma. Then he developed a urinary tract disorder, which required two surgeries. Then he developed epilepsy, where he would have grand mal seizures and just on the floor, nothing you can do until waiting till it's over. He developed a liver problem and an immune system problem, very similar to what you see in an AIDS victim. He, was, he had almost zero immune system. And I kept trying to figure out what's wrong. And it's the same thing that's happening in Mobile, Alabama, the same thing that's happening in Uniontown, same thing that's happening in the 35th Avenue site, where parents are saying, what's going on? Now, first, I believed, I truly believed, my husband's family had bad genes. <laughs> so we looked at his family for 
epilepsy and all, and he didn't. Well, he had some bad genes, but <laughs> not the ones Michael were expressing. Um, and I went to my pediatrician and said, what is going on? I'm perfectly healthy. My family has definitely good genes. Uh, my husband denies anything, so why is my son so sick? And he said, I don't know. Then I got pregnant with my second child, Melissa. And I conceived and carried her at Love Canal in my home. Melissa, too, got very sick. So on Friday, she had these little bruises on her body. Saturday, she had more. Sunday, her entire body was black and blue. And I took her to the pediatrician and said, I don't know what's wrong with her. She was just a toddler, a little, a little girl. I said, you know, she's not throwing up. She's not running a fever. She's not acting like she's sick. But her, her body's just covered with these black and blue marks. And he said he didn't know. And he would take some blood, drew some blood, and then sent us home and said he would call us later in that, that afternoon, and they did. And he called and he said, Mrs. Gibbs, you need to immediately take your daughter to Buffalo Children's Hospital. Do not put a seat harness on her. Do not bump her. Do not squeeze her or put any pressure on her body whatsoever. And get there as soon as you can. I believe your daughter has leukemia. She's a toddler. Buffalo Hospital's 20 minutes away. How do I get her to sit still, right? So I promise her an ice cream cone. Now, you have to remember this, because when we do our organizing on work, you always got to give somebody a piece of candy so they'll do what you want them to do, you know, a reward, carrot and a stick. So she sat down, and she was a very good little girl, and we got to Children's Hospital, and they grabbed her up, and they moved her into this makeshift little room and took me outside and said, okay, Mrs. Gibbs, this is what we have to do. We have to determine whether or not your daughter has leukemia, and in order to do that, we have to insert a needle into her hip. And we have to withdraw some bone marrow. However, because her blood count is so low, her platelets, that's what clods your blood, because her blood count is so low, we don't want to give her heavy anesthetic. So if you could go in and help us to hold her down and calm her down, that would be very helpful. And I'm, I'm her mom. Of course I'm going to do that, right? So I walk in the room, and my daughter is screaming, just screaming. And as she's screaming and crying, her nose is bleeding, her gums are bleeding, the veins under her skin and her face, because of the intensity, were bursting. And I tried to hold her down. There was blood everywhere. And I'm trying to hold my little girl down so they can do this test and trying to calm her down, but I couldn't. And I walked out of the room. I said, I can't do this. I'm going to throw up. i got to go. And as I stood outside the room, I listened to my daughter say, Mama, please, they're hurting me. Mama, please, I promise I'll never be bad again. Please take me home. I tell you this story not because my children suffered more than others. They did not. My children survived. I tell you this story because just like the 35th Avenue site, or Uniontown, or Mobile, just talking about Alabama sites, the city, the state, and the federal government knew. They knew they were poisoning us. They knew it, and they chose to allow it to happen. They chose to say, it's OK for us to be poisoned, for my daughter to sit on that bed and bleed and cry and tr be traumatized. How do I know this? Because in 1976, two years before I knew about Love Canal, there was a report done. So Love Canal has 20,000 tons of chemicals in a rectangular site. It's a landfill. And 
it was leaking into the school where my son was attending kindergarten, but also into the playground in the fields. You couldn't really see anything. You didn't know it was there. The school kept reporting that there were problems on the site and on the playground, so, so the state came in to look at the site and see what's going on. And they hired this consulting firm, and this consulting firm said some of the homes around Love Canal had levels of chemicals in it, inside them, that exceeded a workplace standard for a 160-pound man 40 hours a week. They said that these chemicals were leaking out into the yards and seeping into the basements of homes. Most of us had basements. And volatilizing or evaporating into the air. After the first part of the report talked about how we were being poisoned, and they read the report too. The second part of the report said, so what do we do about it? What are the recommendations? Well, the first recommendation is always do nothing. This has been the case with 35th Street Avenue site. This is the case with Uniontown. This is the case with Mobile, Alabama. This is the case with so many of these sites. And why? What do we all have in common? I will tell you. They decided that the best way to clean up the site was to put a trench around it and a clay cap over the top of it. The clay cap to keep the water from penetrating back into the site and the trench to catch any chemicals that rose in the Love Canal and seeped out to the sides. They would treat them from the, tre from the trench and then they would dispose of it into the sanitary sewer system. They said that that would cost $20 million, $1978. Then there was another part. The other part of it, which plays out in all the towns I've talked about here in Alabama and more, the other part was the cost-benefit analysis. So if we were to spend $20 million to clean up Love Canal, who would benefit? And the way they do that is they look at the income of the households in the area. People, human beings, men, women, children, public health is based on the number of dollars that you bring in. It's based on your personal wealth. There's something wrong with that. There is something wrong with that. So at Love Canal, my husband worked in the industry like most of my neighbors. My husband made $10,000 a year. 1978, it wasn't so little. I know it is now. <laughs> it wasn't great, but it wasn't little. He made $10,000 a year. So he was worth $10,000 annually. I did not work outside the home, so I was worth nothing. Because my son Michael is likely to follow in their footsteps of his daddy, he was worth $10,000 plus an inflation factor. And because Melissa, by this analysis, was likely to follow in the footsteps of her mother, she was worth zero. So when they looked at the Love Canal community, and our income, they made a conscious and deliberate decision. And this is a decision being made today all across America. And that decision was we were not worth $20 million. We were not worth it. And when you look at the site right down the street here, what government is saying, both city government and federal government, is that the folks who live in that community are not worth whatever it will cost to move them out. How dare they? That's not public health. That's not protecting the American citizens. That's not how we are supposed to behave. So I'm Irish. 
and I got my Irish up. <laughs> Nobody puts a dollar sign on my baby's head. Nobody. So I went to the school board, and I banged on the door, and Dr. Long was the head of the superintendent of schools. Again, the school was built on the canal, on the toxic waste. And I asked the, Dr. Long, please move my child from the school because he's really sick. And the school is what's making him sick. And he said, OK, go jump through these hoops, and we'll see what we can do. And the hoops were, go find me two doctors who will write a note saying that. Well, I will tell you, no doctor will write that note because they don't know. And especially back then, because they weren't here in this classroom. Because there was no classroom back then, right? He was a great pediatrician. I loved him. I trusted him with my children. But he said he couldn't write that note. But he wrote a note. And I talk, took it back to Dr. Long. And I said, Dr. Long, here's a note. And, and this is when I learned about power. I know some of you probably know about power because you have power positions. But a, a lot of us don't. Is like at Dr. Long's office, like he had this big oak desk. It was huge and shiny. And then I had to sit in a student chair. So it was like a wonderful life. Did you ever see Wonderful Life when they're <laughs> making that deal? I, I was like sitting down there looking up at him. It was just, in retrospect, it was so disgusting. Um, anyhow, I took the notes back to Dr. Long, and I said, here's your notes that I managed to get. And he pushed those notes back to me and said, Mrs. Gibbs, I'm sorry. I can't move your child based on these notes, because they allude to the area being contaminated. And if I move Michael Gibbs, then I have to move all 407 children who attend that school. And I'm not going to do that because of one irate, hysterical housewife with a sickly kid. And by the way, Mrs. Gibbs, if your kid is so sick, why aren't you home taking care of him? Why are you running around doing all this stuff? That was, that was when I realized that we cannot change the system that's broken right now. We can't change it as an individual looking out for your particular needs, in my case, moving my child. That it really is going to take a lot of people. We live in a democracy. This is a democracy, believe it or not. <laughs> well, maybe the school's not, but <laughs> we live in a bigger democracy. And, and you know, when people stand up and speak out and are united together, we can change anything. I'm a true believer and have seen it with my own eyes that we can change anything. So what I did is I went out with a petition door to door and I started asking moms and dads, like, Do you, are your kids going to the school? Are your kids sick? And lo and behold, we found the whole neighborhood was sick. And we organized the Love Canal Homeowners Association. I really thought that all we needed to do, I know there's some people here from, from the city and, uh, and the federal government, but I have to say, I really thought that all you had to do was show that you were being harmed and your city and your county and your federal government would come and fix it, right? Isn't that what they were, I was taught in high school? If you have a problem and it's not your fault and somebody else is doing it, then they'll come help you. That's why you pay taxes. That's why you do this. So, so I believe that if we proved, because somehow the state isn't getting it, if we proved that we were being made sick from these chemicals, that the government would come in and do the right thing, which we were looking for relocation, which is the same thing the 35th Avenue site folks are looking for as well. And so we went and we did a health study and we collected all this data and we put it together. It wasn't a scientific study that you folks could do. We had no way of verifying data, so forth and so on. But it was a study, nonetheless. And we brought it to the state of New York Health Department. We said, here's the study, look at this. 56% of our children are being born with birth defects. Over half our children had three ears, double rows of teeth, extra fingers, extra toes, or were mentally retarded. The women at Love Canal who were pregnant during that study, there were 22 women who were pregnant. Of those 22 pregnancies, only four normal babies were born. 
The rest of those pregnancies ended in miscarriages, stillbirths, or birth defective children. So we brought this to the state health department and they literally looked at it and they pushed it across the table and it fell on the floor and they said, this is useless housewife data collected by people who have a vested interest in the outcome and it's not validated, so it's useless. All across this country, both universities and local people are trying to show, to demonstrate the harm that's been done to them. The folks in the 35th Avenue site want to know how many of cancers do we have, how many asthmatics, how many emphysemas, how many problems do we have. The Jefferson Health Department did a mortality study. No one has looked at the cancer incident, the respiratory problems, the reproductive problems. No one has done that yet. And that site, I've, I went, visited that site in 2012. So it's not like they haven't had time and they just realized it. It's just they've chosen not to because when they do that, they know they're going to find something and then what are they going to do with that information? Then they might have to act. So at Love Canal, we decided that the answer is science and not science that we need folks like you to help communities figure out what's going on, to help communities figure out how many cancers they have based on the rest of Jefferson County or the rest of the state of Alabama or however you all do that science stuff. I'm so not a science lady. Um, and, and we need that information for those local folks. We, we really need to put that together. But just because you find something that's wrong, something that's abnormal or maybe extremely abnormal, like over 50% of the children being born with birth defects, that's not going to change the outcome. The sad truth is it will not change the outcome of what happens in that community. I have yet to see in my 40 years of visiting communities and working with communities in toxic sites, I've never seen a health study that triggered action. It does do two things. It gives people the information they've been looking for. They want to know, is this unusual? What is happening in my neighborhood? That's really important to their mental health, to understand that, that it's not something they're just thinking. And the other thing it does is it provides some basis for their demands. And in this case, in 35th Street, it's relocation. In Love Canal, it was relocation. So it provides a scientific backdrop. It's not the magic bullet, but the backdrop for their demands. So at Love Canal, what we decided to do, understanding that, is we went out and organized. And we organized our neighborhood. We dogged the health department, we dogged the, the bird dog, the, the governor. Everywhere the governor went, we said, we have 56% birth defect rate and you're not paying attention to it. And we would do human interest stories with Barbara Quimby, my very best friend, who has a child who's severely retarded, uh, and another one with multiple birth defects, and Barbara would tell her story. I've lived here you know, my whole life, I had these children, this is what happened, the human interest story, but keeping the focus on the governor and the health department. So the health department was forced because they were looking so bad in the media. The media drove this. I mean, people drove the media, but the media drove this. They were looking so bad in the media that they had to do something, so they did a health study. And they came to Love Canal to present their health study that they did to us. And they stood on a big stage in an auditorium and they spent the first 20 minutes talking about their methodology and all this kind of background stuff of how they did their study. And then the, the gentleman came forward and said, and here is what we found. We found 56% of the children in this community were born with birth defects. <laughs> oh, gee, right? And the same ones that the Homeowners Association said. Oh, gee. And we found this and we found, and they, they literally mirrored our study, a little, a little different here and there, but, but essentially mirrored it. 
And so we're thinking, okay, because we believe that this is the answer. If we can prove that we're hurt, they will do something. So we're waiting, and after they're done with the report, they said, however, that's the worst word in the world, however, because you know they're going to make an excuse. However, we don't believe that these results, these findings of birth defects and urinary disease and so forth, are related to the 20,000 tons of chemicals buried in the center of the community. What we believe is going on here is that this is a random clustering of genetically defective people. And how many of you took stats? And how many of you know that that could really be, right? It's a one in a gazillion, but it could be, right? And so we're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this, right? So, so we had to continue to organize and, and go after the governor during elections, go after President Carter during his election. And, and we finally won relocation. And 800 families won the ability to get out of Love Canal with their homes being purchased by the state of New York. And later, they sued the responsible party, which was Occidental Petroleum, to recoup the money. So the government actually didn't pay for it, but they paid for it initially. But this same thing is happening all across the country, and it's happening in your backyard. You don't have to do much but just walk down the street in Fairmont near the ERP plant and watch the black soot come out. You can see it. You don't need to test it. You can see it. You just knock on one door or two doors and you'll hear a story of somebody who's dying of cancer or just died of cancer. You'll hear those stories all across the country. That as a, as a society, we need to change what we are doing. The burden of proof, the burden that you are being harmed is placed in this country on the victims. You prove that your cancer is not related to your lifestyle, your house, your mold, your whatever. You prove that there's a problem here. And the communities that are being asked to prove don't have the resources. They're poor communities, they're African American communities, they're Latino communities, and it's happening everywhere. So in, in San Jose, California, there was a bunch of moms sitting at a park, and they're all worried about their kids. You know, don't get on there, Jimmy. Don't do this. Don't do that. And all of a sudden, the moms started talking to each other because they were being a little overly careful, only to find out that all of their children, all four of those children, had the same heart birth defect. And they had the same surgery. It's like, how could that be? We're not related. We aren't even the same race, some of us. How could that be? It could be because TCE was in their drinking water. And when they were drinking the drinking water during their pregnancy, TCE causes heart birth defects. It's now known. Their government knew that they were being exposed to TCE in their drinking water and chose to do nothing. When the mothers rose up and said, no, our children are being born with this, this rare heart defect. You need to fix the water. They're saying, prove it. Just because four ladies are at a park and you happen to have the same kids with the same problem doesn't make it an epidemic, doesn't make it a big problem. All across the country, the same thing is happening over and over again. We've learned over my 40 years that science is really important. Health studies are really important. Taking levels of lead in children are extraordinarily important. But what also is important goes beyond that. So in America, the other thing we thought about at Love Canal, and it's still true today, we thought that we had legal rights. I heard there were some people here from the law school. Um, that it cannot be legal in America. It cannot be legal to poison people, <laughs> right? If I was to put arsenic in all of those bottles of water that you all just drank, 
and you all got sick, guess who's going to jail? The school is too, because they have joint and several liability, right? So how come industries can put equal amount of poison in the air and in the soil and poison people and it's okay? In America, we have a system, a regulatory system, that allows industries to poison the environment and all the habitants in the environment, whether it's humans or animals or marine life. They're called permits, <laughs> right? So, so all of the industry have permits to release a certain amount of chemicals into the air, the water, and the soil. Now, these are legal permits. So they're only allowed to put X amount into the air, water, and soil. However, when you go to a place like North Birmingham, how many industries do you have there who have permits that are about their single stack and their single release? Well, when you look at the combined situation, the combined release, what is that doing to the habitants of that part of the earth? I have been voting since I was 18. And I have never seen a constitutional amendment that said, we should allow industry to poison people. And we'll do it through permits. How did that ever happen? The other thing that's interesting about these permits, so when you think of permits, I don't, is there any hunters in here? People who do deer hunting or? Yeah. So, so there are seasons when you cannot do deer hunting. And you can't hunt deer because that's when it's a reproductive season. Right? And even, even when you do, I don't know what Alabama's rules are, but my family's a hunters. They're just, they just are. But they eat it. They don't throw it away. <laughs> so so you can, when you go hunting and you get a permit or a license to go hunting, you are not allowed to take the babies. You are not allowed to take the pregnant deer, does. In these permits that are given to industries across America, the thing that is harmed most is the unborn and young child. So we have permits to, that do not protect the most vulnerable amongst us. How did that happen? I mean, I'm literally, I'm 68 years old. I'm an old woman. And I've never understood how did that happen? Why did we let that happen? And how do we undo that? And how do we look at places like North Birmingham where it's not a single release? It's not just ERP. Maybe we could live with that. But it's ERP, ABC, DEF, I don't know. All those dudes out there, right? And, and they all have permits. And even if they all stayed in their permit, which I doubt they do, but even if they all stayed in their permit, people are going to die. Because you cannot be exposed to that and live a healthy green life. You just can't. So we have a problem with our permit system. It is not illegal. So I went to my lawyer and said, it's got to be illegal. I need a lawyer. And the lawyer said, Lois, just sit down. It's not illegal. They're allowed to put this stuff in the ground. And they know it's going to leak, but it's not illegal. It's got to change. It's really got to change, especially in areas that have a number of industries. Most of the areas with a number of industry or a cluster of industry are sacrifice zones. That's truly what they are. They're not EJ communities. They're sacrifice zones. And those folks have been chosen to be sacrificed by no by no fault of their own. They just live there. And one industry came in, and then another industry came in, and another industry came in, and another industry came in. By no fault of their own, they are being sacrificed for something. So science is useful, not the magic bullet. There are regulatory things we can play with, but they're not the answer, and they're also not the magic bullet. 
The only thing that has changed, whether you talk about Times Beach, Missouri, Love Canal, is when we organize as a united group, we stand up and we speak out. That's when we win justice for people. We have to organize. So I actually, I want to leave time for questions. I actually want you all to organize. So here's what you have to do is put this number in your phones. You all got phones? <laughs> So the number is 205-254-2771. That number is the number of City Hall. <laughs> that number is the number of the mayor's office. And we are trying really hard to get some help for the 35th Street site. And we are asking the mayor to relocate the families and redevelop that land. We're not asking to close the industry. Nobody's suggesting we close the industry. We are suggesting that they move the sacrifice zoned families out of harm's way. So if you, if you get mad at your spouse or your dog or your professor, don't yell at them. Instead, call this number <laughs> and say, I'm really angry. I am so mad right now, and here's what I want you to do, is relocate those families and redevelop the area. That's really easy to do, right? It's really easy. And, it, and your professor will not give you a bad grade. <laughs> your loved one will still speak to you, and your dog doesn't have to go to the vet for a broken leg, right? So everybody is happy. Environmental justice is, is really, uh, a thing in this country that is getting worse and not better. Environmental justice everywhere. The communities that are being chose for developing of highly polluting industrial sites are communities of color and communities of low wealth. We have some pretend rules and laws. For example, President Clinton did the environmental justice executive order in 1990. What it says is before you put a nasty thing in a community, you gotta make, you gotta check and see if it's an environmental justice community. Poor, of color, da 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 da. And so people do that. In Ohio, it was just like unbelievable. They came in and they said, yes, you are an environmental justice community. You're African American, you're poor, you're whatever. But we're gonna put it here anyhow. Because there's no rules that say they can't. It just says they have to look. Look and see if it's an EJ community, and if it's an EJ community, you should make amends. OK, so they put the incinerator there. It's an EJ community, defined as such by government. So what do they get as an EJ community? Do the fines when Heritage does something wrong go to the community for a better park, for medical care? For No. Fines go to the state and the EPA. No, community doesn't see any of them, right? So do they get information that without being charged for the cost of the freedom of information request? No. In fact, we're still fighting about a $3,000 bill they gave to this poor community to get information about the incinerator that is literally poisoning their school. It's in a valley. It's in the Ohio Valley. And there's a cliff above it. The stack just comes over the cliff, just a smidgen. And the smoke from the stack goes right into the elementary school, literally into the elementary school. Can they find out what's in that smoke? No, not unless they pay $3,000. If you're an environmental justice community, you don't get anything but designated as an environmental justice community. Oh boy, isn't this a good day? We need to change these things, and you all are in a position where you could influence that whichever positions you are in, that we cannot allow, because we now know, right? You all know, I told you, and you can check it. I will give you all the references you need. So you all know that we are living in an unfair world, in an unfair place. You all have an education, more than probably most of the environmental justice communities across the country, formal education. You all have to help these folks. Figure out what you can do for them. Figure out how we change the system of permitting, of sacrifice zones, 
of allowing people to live in an area we know is really dangerous, and especially in an area like North Birmingham. There's no reason for that. There's absolutely no reason. Those folks did nothing wrong. They <laughs> moved into their house. They were raising their family. They had a garden. They hung their clothes out to dry, and then they got polluted. And they couldn't hang their clothes out anymore because they would get dirty with the soot. And they couldn't eat out of the garden anymore, which was a healthy food for them years ago, right? Because they have a food desert, and they have a health care desert. We need to help them. That's why you have to call that number. Did you all write it down? Put it in your phone? All right, good job. Okay, so, so I just want to close with the lessons from Love Canal is that there isn't any magic bullet in this. It's really going to take all of us to try and figure out how do we change a system? How do we change a system that is fair to all people, regardless of income, regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of all those things? We cannot continue like this. We know better. We're better people. We're moral people. We're, we're, we're Americans, for goodness sakes, right? We can do this. There's no magic bullets. It's only about political aspirations. I don't know who's up for election. Whoever's up for election in Alabama should be the one you're bird dogging. You should bird dog them and say, what are you going to do about 35th Avenue site? I know it's really hard. Those who have time that, that are here locally, you can help this group on 35th Avenue by contacting GASP. I don't know their, their email address, but it's really easy. And they are approved for this program, I heard yesterday. They're looking for volunteers to help them door knock in the neighborhood. They're looking for volunteers to help them do a whole host of things on the 35th Avenue site. So you can just look them up on the website. Uh, and actually, Michael and Christian is here. Um, and volunteer your time. You know, maybe you guys could do a health study there. I don't know. But anything you could do would be really, really helpful.